So hello, you are joining us for the fourth uh, Level Up with Fusion webinar from Autodesk. And these are, of course, webinar series to help support teachers like you uh, in using Fusion 360 and other Autodesk programs with your students to engage them in the real world of technology, engineering, design, or whatever it is that you decide to teach. And I see that we do have folks teaching all across the STEM fields and things, which is hugely fantastic. Uh, I'm going to take a second just to introduce who you're hearing from. My name's Jason Erdreich. I'm a STEM educator from the U.S. on the East Coast, and I am working with Autodesk to provide uh, webinars like this for you to make sure that you are supported as you teach and engage with your students. And I'm joined, as always, from my co-host, Randy, if you want to say hi. Hi, I'm Randy. I'm on the Autodesk team. I largely work on Tinkercad and Instructables, and I'm excited to be here helping out. Yeah, thanks, Randy. And listen, behind the scenes, I'm not sure if you can see us all here, but Nicole's here with us as well. And usually a handful of the Autodesk and Tinkercad team members always join us and they're working uh, really hard this entire webinar. So if you see questions and answers and things like that in the chat, usually that's Nicole, Randy, or someone else from the Autodesk team. So huge thank you to the Autodesk team for helping me coordinate this and run this webinar and to provide the support to you as we go ahead and we learn about all these awesome features. So before we dive in, let's talk a little bit about the series. If you're new, um, we are holding this level up with Fusion in ed secondary education series to, again, support teachers as they're teaching Fusion 360 and awesome concepts and things like that. And we certainly will go over a bit of an introduction in a minute. This webinar series was to be held every other Thursday. And as I mentioned, we're on our fourth right now. And we have another one scheduled in two weeks on February 1st. That one is called Getting Started with CNC, uh, or like manufacturing using the Manufacture tab for subtractive, milling, routers, lathes, things like that. So we'll be talking about that in two weeks. But as we mentioned before the new year, and this of course is the first time coming back since the new year, so happy new year to all of you, uh, wherever you are in the world. But before the new year, we mentioned that we might be tweaking the schedule a little bit and finding more ways to support you. And we're super excited that we have a new series coming out in a couple weeks that's going to provide a really wide range of support across the Autodesk products like Fusion, Tinkercad, and more. So we'll talk more about that in two weeks in our next webinar series, but just know that there'll be some calendar changes and things like that coming in the coming weeks. Uh, and we're super excited to be providing even more content and training and all these exciting things to you. So stay tuned, keep in touch with Tinkercad through the Tinkercad blog and uh, check out our social media pages because we will be tweaking things over the coming weeks. But again, we're here tonight for the series, uh, the webinar called Rendering Animation. And we'll see you in two weeks again for another Fusion series called uh, Start Getting Started with CNC. Now, what we'd like to do is learn a little bit more about your classroom. So we're going to launch a poll right now, and we're trying to gauge your class sizes. And what I mean by that is more of like how many students you teach. Um, and Randy, this actually, here we go, uh, class size survey. So this says class size, but it could also be like your total uh, total students as well. So like if you have multiple classes, how many students do you teach with? Do you not teach any students right now? Maybe you're a coordinator or a supervisor or something, but we'd love to learn roughly how big your program is or how many students that you're working with. Um, just so we can kind of gauge again, you know, when you're trying to teach and you're trying to support these students, what is uh, your, your student population size? Because we want to provide as many resources as we can to you to help support all of your uh, student engagement and things. So I'm seeing we're pretty, pretty diverse, pretty spread out. We have some smaller programs, some bigger programs. Um, Really, really cool. Thank you for everyone for answering the survey here. I'll give you just another second uh, if you don't mind answering it because this uh, helps us learn or things. I also see that Nicole dropped a link to the Tinkercad blog in the chat. So like I said, stay up to date, stay uh, in tune with what's going on. We have some really exciting things coming out over the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so I think this is really cool. Thank you for completing the survey. I can see that not only do we have uh, really diverse class topics. Some folks are teaching in more broad STEM. Some of us are teaching specific design modeling, engineering, robotics, etc. But also a wide range of class sizes as well. Super cool. So thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight into your programs. Now, how to participate in this webinar series, if this is the first one you've attended, uh, the best way is to use the Q&A section. So there's a Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. The Q&A allows you to uh, ask a question, and it doesn't go away. It stays there um, until we answer it, which is super handy for us. You'll notice that the chat moves super fast. 
So we'll be putting links and useful resources in the chat, and you can certainly drop in questions and thing in this, things in the chat as well. But sometimes if you just put a question in the chat, we might miss it because it's scrolling so quickly as everyone's kind of giving us information as we're providing information to you. So the best way to ask a question is using the Q&A button. And after a question has been answered, you can actually go to the answer tab and you'll be able to go back and see all those answers as well, which is super handy. Um, after we kind of go through the training and all these things like that, for tonight, we will have a dedicated Q&A where you can be asking uh, myself and the other Autodesk team members questions and kind of recap and review the things that we go over with you. So keep that in mind that we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And I also just want to remind all of you that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and tomorrow, we will be following up with the recording for this webinar, as well as links to all of the previous webinars. Uh, because again, we've done a number of these for this year, as well as many in the past. So you can always review all that on the Autodesk YouTube channel. And I'm sure there's a link coming to the chat very soon that kind of shows you how to get there. And even the slideshows that I'm using, so the slides that I'm presenting with, will also be shared. So to all of our attendees here, we're going to send you the follow-up link, as well as some other useful information, the slide, all of these great things. So I know we're going to cover a lot in just a small time that we have, but just know that there's plenty of ways to revisit, recap, and review. So before we dive in, let's talk a little bit about Fusion 360. It is one of the Autodesk programs, and it's a very diverse program in what your students can create with it. It provides a lot of real-world industry standard opportunities, like designing 3D models, coming into the world of manufacturing, which is what our next webinar series is going to be all about, working specifically with electronics, simulating to figure out if our parts are going to break or if they're strong enough, creating generative designs, which allows us to use smart, intelligent software to help us optimize optimizer designs like the industry standard pros, and even collaborating and working with each other. Something else we can do is rendering and animation, which is what tonight is all about. But in case you didn't know, Fusion 360 really allows your students to be designing real world products, maybe even manufacturing those products right in the classroom. And it's a real, really great program to also elevate or level up from Tinkercad into a more advanced experience, which I'll also be talking about a little bit tonight, because I'm sure some of you are still coming from the Tinkercad area, but you might want to be bringing students into a more advanced environment. We're going to show you as many resources as we can to support that wide range of student population. Students can access uh, Fusion 360 through either the web browser, so you can load it in any web browser on pretty much any device, just like Tinkercad, or there is also an offline desktop version for Windows and Mac computers as well. Uh, Fusion is completely free for students and educators, though you do need to create a free Autodesk account in order to access Fusion 360. Um, this gives you all the features and things like that as if you had a premium paid account, but again, it's free for education. Um, to create a student account, you might need to be a different age uh, or of an age. Like For example, it's 13 in the US, but that varies a little bit from region to region. But again, it's completely free for students and educators to create an account and access Fusion 360. You can also create what's called a team in Fusion 360. So this is kind of like class, uh, classrooms or classes in Tinkercad, but you could, for example, create a team, invite your students, maybe even make different uh, teams within your Fusion 360 window. So that way students can be working collaboratively among group members. You as the teacher can see and monitor their work. You can even provide feedback and things like that, sign in, see what they're creating. And all that's done through the Fusion 360 Teams app which again, you can access for free using your Autodesk account. And Fusion 360 is pretty much infinitely customizable. So when I'm sharing my screen tonight, you might notice that my toolbar is slightly different and I have slightly different icons. I'm not using any special version. I'm using the uh, education version, just like all of you would, but I have modified my toolbar. I've changed some of my settings. I've made it fit me and my style. And as a teacher, I always love walking my students through that, showing them like the buttons that you push all the time Let's put that as a shortcut, and I'll show you how to do that when we dive into Fusion. Something that also is really great is that you can actually change the default navigation settings to match Tinkercad. So for example, if you're coming from Tinkercad or your students are coming from Tinkercad, they might be used to how rotating and orbiting around looks, how to right click and select things and drag things. You can actually make Fusion 360 mimic the Tinkercad mouse controls, which makes transitioning from Tinkercad to Fusion really, really easy to do. And we have a blog post on how to do that. And again, this is all linked in the slideshow that will be shared with you as well. So rendering uh, in Fusion 360, right? What does that actually mean? Well, you can create a 3D design, right? Similar to how you can do in Tinkercad. You can even bring a Tinkercad design in. But Fusion allows you to not only change the color of your designs, 
It allows you to apply materials, change camera, lighting angles, add backdrops, all the things like my animated image here to allow you to create what is essentially a realistic, real world simulated view of your designs in a 3D or a 2D space. And this, of course, is used by professionals everywhere. Every product, every company that creates some type of technology, product, whatever it is, like if it's a new car, for example, that they're designing, they're going to render it on the screen. They're going to see what it looks like. They might even show it to investors or customers to get their opinions about it before they launch this product, before they put it on sale. And this goes for sneakers, cars, pretty much anything in the world. Even a lot of times when, for example, uh, a company is going to release something new before they have the real prototypes, before they have the real products in their hands, they might release to the public a just beautiful rendering. Also, in the world of uh, animated movies and things like that, rendering is essentially how a lot of the video games, the movies, the things that we're seeing is created. And your students can get a taste of that as they render their own designs right in Fusion 360. And I'm going to walk you through how to do this. So I, I mentioned a moment ago that you can actually start from Tinkercad or you can start from Fusion, but because I know we have a number of users that might be new to Fusion, uh, I'm going to show you how to start from Tinkercad. Not that you need to do this, you can make a brand new Fusion design, uh, but and I'll show you both. I will show you both. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a design that I have here in uh, Tinkercad. And this is not a model that I created. It's one of the featured models from the Tinkercad gallery. And the link for this uh, vice is going to be in the slideshow. Right, so you can see that I have a vice created here, and this was created using all of the basic shapes. So it's super easy to import a design from Tinkercad, but the basic shapes are the ones that import directly. If you use some of like the shape generators, uh, they might not import correctly. But after I have my design, I'm simply going to hit this export button and then hit this take your designs with Autodesk Fusion 360 button. And if I'm signed into my Autodesk account, and if I'm part of a team, which at the moment I'm not, but let's say I was a student and I was part of a team called, you know, Mr. E's STEM class, I would actually see that team right here and I can send it directly to my class, or maybe I would call it period five, and I could send it directly to my period five class, or I can just hit send and I can actually download it local on my desktop or broken it up in the browser, depending on what my account was. And after sending this to Fusion, if I just switch my screens here so you can now see Fusion 360, we have the vice imported. And this pulls it directly into the Fusion 360 menu. All of the shapes and everything like that was just imported as a body. So I can see the different shapes are these bodies and these parts that I have to work with in my Fusion 360 design. Now, when you do this, there's a couple things that you want to do immediately. So in Fusion 360, a key tool is called the parametric timeline. And this is a tool that we use to edit and make changes and tweak our design. So if you were going to make a new design in Fusion, the timeline's already there by default. If you've imported a design, like from Tinkercad, we need to enable this timeline. And to do that, I'm going to right click on the top of my, my design name right here. This first part in my browser is the design. You can kind of see that everything is within this part, if you will. And I'm going to hit Capture Design History. Now I have this timeline at the bottom. And every change I make to my design will now appear on this timeline. So for example, if I wanted to make this handle just a little bit taller, I might use the Extrude tool, extrude this up a little bit, make this handle piece a little bit taller. And notice that an extrude was just added on my timeline. And if I were to double click on this, I can make a change to that. So I can actually come in here and I can modify this and I can tweak it. So this is a key part of Fusion, and it's something that you might want to do if you actually want to be able to adjust and modify and tweak your designs, as well as bring them directly in to Fusion 360. Something else you want to do is you want to turn your bodies, which are these basic primitive shapes, into components. And the reason being, this gives us a lot more flexibility as we are not only rendering, but also animating our designs, which we'll get to later tonight. So for example, I'm going to actually right click body, here, this bodies folder, and this includes all of the basic primitive shapes that I've imported from Tinkercad. And I'm going to click create components from bodies. And notice that now each shape is a component. So there's a lot of benefits to doing this. One of the key ones is I can now interact with each shape individually. So I can actually click on all these things and drag them around as if they were the shapes in Tinkercad. So this is kind of more like how navigating in Tinkercad feels, where each shape can just be dragged on, clicked on, whatever it is. I can, of course, 
revert my position and bring everything back using my position toolbar, right? But this means that not only can I drag and interact with each shape as an individual component uh, here in Fusion, it also means that I can manipulate these shapes individually once we start to get into the rendering and animation piece as well. A lot of that is based on the individual components. Now, even though I've turned these into components, it doesn't mean I can't still modify this. So for example, again, if I wanted to like extrude a face, like if I wanted to make this face a little bit thicker or taller or whatever it is, I certainly can do that. So I can easily add material and manipulate that just like I could before. It just means that those things are happening individually within each subcomponent or each part of our design, which gives us again, just a little bit more control. Uh, as we're trying to do things like rendering, animation, even assemblies or things like that, which is what we talked about in our last webinar, if you want to learn more about multi-part designs. Now, before we uh, dive in and move into rendering, um, something else that I just want to show you real quick is those settings and things. So you'll notice that I have some different buttons here. Um, so if you want to customize your toolbar, like for example, let's say that you're consistently using the thread tool and you're constantly putting threads on different parts, which is a super great Fusion 360 feature. It automatically draws uh, threads and things like that. I can just right click on this and hit pin to toolbar. And now all of a sudden I have the threads tool up here on my toolbar and I can uh, drag and reorganize this however I want. You can, of course, if there's a tool that you don't use very frequently, like if you don't use this form tool, you can actually uh, adjust it and remove that from your toolbar as well. So I can actually unpin this from my toolbar if that's not something I use very frequently, right, which is super handy. And under your actual uh, preferences menu, which I'm hoping you can see here, I think you can, um, this is where you can actually change your view and everything to look like uh, Tinkercad or even other Autodesk uh, software programs if you're coming from, say, Inventor or something as well. So I mentioned some of those earlier, um, and I just want to show you where they were. So uh, if we look into another tab, we're going to leave the Design tab, and we're going to switch to the Render tab. And this is where we can start to make our design look a little bit more realistic, right? So you can already tell that we have some lighting, some shadows. It looks different from the design window. And I need to emphasize that every single thing in this window is completely customizable. So we certainly aren't gonna get into every little feature tonight, but I'm gonna show you the general principles of how can you modify and adjust. Um, oops, so I'm gonna put this back where this goes. I didn't mean to actually move my design. Let me just shift that back. Here we go. So the first thing that you can do is you can adjust your uh, materials. So if I open up the appearance menu, I can apply different materials to my design. And what you're looking at here are colors that actually imported from Tinkercad. But we have a pretty extensive Fusion 360 library. So for example, I could go to the metal category and I'm gonna go down to, let's say, um, steel. And I can see all of these different steels that I could use. Um, I could even go to, let's say, um, where do I want to go? Coatings, you know, coated metal, platinum, silver, stainless, right? All of these different properties that we can work with, right? I'm actually going to go to paint and I'm going to go to powder coat because I'm thinking this vice is going to kind of be rough powder coated. And I'm going to grab this powder coat uh, blue, rough. And I can literally drag and drop it onto the different parts that I want to powder coat blue. And we can see that we have a little bit of a texture here, but I need to emphasize that this is not rendered yet. We're looking at a very, very basic preview. So this is not showing us our design at full detail yet. I'm gonna go back into metal and I'm gonna switch to, um, let's find something kind of shiny. So I'm gonna maybe go into stainless and I'm gonna grab um, I don't know, one of these stainlesses, you can see that there's a little download arrow. So not all of these are going to be downloaded directly to your computer to save space, but if you want, you can easily download them. And I'm going to drag this stainless steel polished onto all the metal parts of my vise here. So I'm just moving this around, adding these parts, and we can see that we kind of have a shiny, shiny appearance as we go. And then I'm just going to go and I'm going to grab some type of glossy black paint and drag that onto my black plastic handles. Um, if you're having a hard time getting to your handle like I was there, just change your view 
to do this here. Hang on one sec. I think Fusion is just a little upset with all the different views I have open right now. Okay. So we have some different materials and things like that, which is super great. I want to just switch back to my slideshow real quick, um, just to show you that everything that I'm talking about is going to be um, reviewed and included in the slideshow as well. So that's super great. So even though I'm going through some of this stuff rather quickly, everything are going to be here in the notes. So if you want to re go back and revisit some things, so that's not a problem at all. And I also just want to show you that while we're looking at a preview that's kind of quick, um, there's something called an in-canvas render. And in-canvas rendering takes um, some time. So as it's rendering, especially because it's using your computer hardware and things like this to render your computer uh, or to render your design, um, it does take some time. Like for example, a rendering might take two minutes or so. So obviously tonight, I'm not gonna make you sit here and watch my two minute render. So I'm gonna consistently be switching back and forth between some designs that have been pre-rendered versus some of the ones that I'm doing here with you, just so we don't have to necessarily wait for all the loading time and things like that. Um, but again, all of the notes, I see some folks asking, how do we review? We're going kind of quick. So again, I just want to show you that the slideshow is available and that's going to include all of the different settings. Now, if I was going to actually want to render this in like a real, a real view, a high definition view, I would change my camera angle to something I wanted to see and I would push this in canvas render button and notice immediately that the colors changed. And we can see that this is actually loading to what's considered to be an excellent quality. And I can actually adjust the buffer. So if I wanted, let's say, for example, a better quality, I can actually drag this over and render this to be something a little bit higher. I could go to an infinite quality and just let my computer run for hours until I'm really happy with a rendering or something like that. But you can see how much the colors change, the metal changes, everything changes as you are actually rendering your design. So this is now uh, a slightly better in canvas rendering view. Now, the second I go to change my view, the rendering goes away. So every time we change our camera angle or our view, the render goes away, but we can of course save our renders by capturing these images here. Now, before I dive into some more complex rendering, I wanna show you a really cool tip that I like to do in our design. I find that sometimes hard edges, like sharp edges from the shapes that we import from Tinkercad, like for example, and I'm gonna render real quick, this hard edge right here, or these hard edges right here, don't really capture the light very well. So something that I always love to do when I bring my Tinkercad designs in is add fillets, like rounded edges or chamfers. And I find them that really enhances the render. So take a minute, I'm not gonna let this render all the way, but just notice how the light doesn't really capture the changes in the sides of these boxes and how dark this corner is right here. Let's go back to the design window. And I'm just going to very quickly add a fillet to this edge. So this is going to round the edge of this vise right here. And I'm going to add a very simple chamfer onto the faces of my vise chocks here. And that's going to add just a slant on those like so. And Fusion's really awesome because you can go back and forth between the design window and the render window and notice that this design just automatically updated. So I can modify and tweak my designs like this in between my renderings. I can see that, you know what, maybe it's not quite looking the way that I want. But notice now that I've just added this rounded and chamfered edges, uh, it really enhances, in my opinion, just the way that the light really catches on the design. So that's a pretty awesome tip and something easy that you can do just to change the way that the light falls over. I get a lot more detail in the shape just by adding some fillets, some chamfers uh, in our design here. It really makes it kind of pop with the different lighting. But let's actually also talk about lighting. I showed you how you can adjust the appearance of something. Like for example, I can of course drag the steel out, but you can also modify all of these appearances. So if I were, for example, going to edit this polished steel, and I don't know if you can see my edit window, I think it might be off my zoom screen right now, but I can actually change, for example, the roughness or the brightness or even the shade. If I wanted to tint this steel, I can actually adjust all of these different appearance shapes and modify them. And you can actually copy them and save them as your own unique shapes as well. So all of the, while you have a super extensive library of woods and paints and metals and things like this in Fusion that you can use, all of these can be customized to really fine tune. So if, we, if I was looking for a very specific shade of powder coat, I can actually tweak this and modify this to be whatever color powder coat I wanted it to be.
which is super cool. So you have a lot of customizability and flexibility with the materials that you are working with. Now, in terms of the lighting, this can also be customized. So if I actually adjust what's called our scene settings, first off, you can see that I can easily tweak the brightness, which is sort of like the exposure, and it actually gives you a, a lux rating. So super accurate in terms of actually adjusting our, uh, our brightness here. You can change the way that you want your background to be. So for example, if I wanted this to be, um, and I just need to change, close my windows here, I can set this to be a color, which I don't think is appearing on the Zoom screen, but basically a little color box appears. It's just kind of coming off of the screen that's being shared, unfortunately. But I can adjust the color to be like, for example, a white background if I wanted it to be. I can also adjust my background to be uh, an environment. So from the environment library, I can drag in an environment and you can actually import custom environments as well. So for example, I could put my vice on a dry lake bed if I wanted to, which maybe isn't really relevant or appropriate for a vice per se, but it is super relevant if you were designing a house or a piece of furniture or a building or something like that, right? So you can actually put these in different environments and you can even adjust the position of the environment around your model. Now, here's something that's really cool that I want to point out. I'm actually going to, I want you to look at my Chrome here, and you'll notice that the kind of environment, the lighting, the sun, the clouds, it all changes, and it changes the way that the Chrome appears, right? That happens even if I have a solid color background. So, for example, I might choose this lake bed or these crossroads environments because it gives me maybe a sunset. And even though I have a white background, I can still use the, the red tones and the sunset lighting from this crossroads here to give me a reflection on my chrome or a shadow on my model like I want it to. So even if you have a solid background, you can still adjust the position and the lighting and the way that the tones of the background play, especially off your metallic surfaces, which is super cool. If you want, you can have a ground plate, which is how you get or remove uh, this um, shadow and you can change, you can even enable reflections and things like that, um, which I don't think I can do with my, uh, the background that I have right now, but you can add reflections if you wanted to have like a metallic surface and things. You can change your camera perspective. You can change your camera exposure. You can even change the depth of field. Uh, and the different center of focus. So for example, if you want to put something out of focus or in focus like that, you can change all of this. So if you had a logo that you wanted to zoom in and put that in focus, you can change all of these settings. to again, really create essentially as if like this is a photo studio for our designs. And a couple other things that are super fun to do. And if you want, you could of course save these things as default settings if you'd like. You can import a logo or like an image to put onto your designs. So if I wanted to brand this vice, uh, say Autodesk, for example, I can import a graphic here and put it anywhere on my design. So you can add to branding and I can even increase the scale. Uh, oops, not like that. That's not gonna make my Autodesk team happy with me if I disproportionate my scale here. Hang on one sec. Let me, uh, I'm gonna delete this guy and fix this here so I can proportionally scale it. Here we go. So we can make this a little bit bigger all around and rotate it and make it fit onto my design. There we go, that looks much better. So you can put a logo in and all that would render as well. So if I were to now with some of our lighting changes real quick, run an in-canvas render, we'll start to see how those details play out. But again, I'm not going to let this run for too long because I don't want to take too much time letting this load, although it is going quite quick right now, which is really nice. The speed of rendering is going to change a little based on your device, how much processing power it has, but also based on the complexity of your model. So for example, if you're doing something that's perfectly mirrored, really, really shiny chrome, that's going to take a little bit longer to render than if you're running like really flat surfaces because things like that might vary the time. But in general, you can see right now we're going about 30 seconds for this to render a nice design, which is super cool. Something else I like to do um, as I am designing a rendering map or something like this is to create a scene around it. So for example, this is a vice. In theory, this vice would be sitting on you know a workbench, a table, right? So I'm going to go back to my design window and I'm going to create a table. 
Um, I'm going to, um, let me just create this here on my top plane. I'm gonna create just a really big rectangle around my vise. And of course I could do it smaller, but I want this to be fully encompassing my vise and my view. And I'm gonna extrude it so it's a solid shape. And I'm gonna make sure I do it as a new shape so I don't merge it with my vise. So I have this new component, which is my table. And I accidentally merged that. Hang on one sec, didn't mean to do this. I don't want the vise and the table to be attached. That would be bad. That kind of defeats the purpose. Let's try this one more time. So I'm going to extrude this so it's a new component. Here we go. So now I have this table piece separate from my vise. I'm going to go back to my rendering window. We can see I have my table, which is super great. If I zoom in on my vise, we can see that the table is just there all around it. And I'm going to go to the appearance window and let's find a piece of uh, wood or a wood texture here that works. Like for example, maybe some, um, I don't know, let's go with some, a nice pine light table, which is fine. Um, I accidentally just applied my pine to my vise as well, which is less fine. Didn't mean to do that, but here we go technical difficulties with my rendering configuration. That looks much better. Pine table, blue vise. And if we go to render it, we can see that we have a nice table that's slowly and surely appearing and also reflecting under my vise. So just ignore the fact that I accidentally painted my vise wood. That's not necessarily what you wanna do. Um, but I also wanna point out what I consistently am doing here are these in canvas renders. This is still a lower resolution version of a full render here. If I actually click the render button, you'll notice we have a number of settings. So for example, I can adjust my aspect ratio. So when I do an in canvas render, it's rendering it to be whatever the screen size currently is. Here, if I do a full render, I can adjust my screen size. I can export this to be a really high quality photo. I can choose to render it locally. This is using the hardware of my own computer, so my own graphics card. But let's say, for example, your students are designing on a Chromebook, that might render really slowly. You can actually render through Fusion 360 Cloud and education users get unlimited cloud credits to allow them to do this. So that way your students don't have to spend hours rendering on a very small desktop Chromebook. You can actually render very quickly through the Fusion Cloud, and this will actually export really high quality uh, photos, videos, et cetera, for you to actually work with your renders. And you can see it takes a little bit longer. It says less than 20 minutes. Realistically, I find that it usually takes four to five minutes, but it could vary depending on your design. And I'm gonna to switch to one that I've rendered ahead of time. Um, and you can see that these high definition renders appear down here in your rendering gallery. And you can open them, you can preview them, you can zoom in on them and things like that. You also can even create what's called a turntable render which will rotate around and give you multiple views and things like this. So this is the more high quality type of image that you can create using the rendering window after you set and adjust all of your different settings as you go. Now, again, I need to emphasize that rendering is hugely customizable and realistically we can spot, probably spend the whole hour just talking about rendering, but hopefully you can see how easy it is to kind of change your camera angles around, assign your appearances, add, decals, logos, things like that, and create really beautiful, really stunning images of your designs in some type of 3D and simulated space, which is super awesome. Now, I wanna also transition to another tab, uh, and I'm gonna go back to my um, copy of my vice here. And I'm also just going to very quickly fix my uh, pine, bars here. Not really sure how I did that. I think I just had everything selected when I dragged some materials out. So I have more of a real vice. And I want to show you animation. So the animation tab allows us to create essentially an animated movie or video of our product. And this works completely based off of components. So we can see all of my components here. And for example, you can turn components off. So maybe in this animation, I don't actually want my 
table so I can find my table component. And I'll be honest, my Fusion workspace isn't super organized right now. In the last webinar, we talked about how important it is to label your components to make it really easy to find and uh, view your different products and parts here. Okay. And what I have is essentially the ability to move around and modify my design space. Now, everything I do is recorded on this storyboard in my animation timeline. So for example, you'll notice that I have a bunch of camera angles. If I were to push play right now, you literally see everything I just did. And I don't want that. So I don't actually want to record my camera movement. Um, I might actually want to, for example, turn off this component and get my camera to a good starting position for my animation. Then what I do is I drag my timeline here to a duration of time that I want to skip to. So for example, one second. After one second, what is it that I want to do? Well, maybe I want to rotate uh, around my design like this. When I push play, that's exactly what happens. So that camera movement is now recorded after a second. And then maybe after another second, I want to rotate and I have to realistically zoom out. This is going to be a very, very nauseating animation here for a second. I apologize. And go like that. So as you move your camera around, it actually records your movements. Now, what happens if I want to zoom in on my design, but I don't want to record the movements? So for example, if I want to zoom and not let it be recorded, I can turn off camera recording right here. So if I press this view button, now when I move, my camera movements are not recorded. So I can just rotate around my design. And maybe I want to actually animate this vice functioning fully, right? So I'm going to use this transform button and I'm going to select uh, my handle components here. So hang on one sec, transform. And I'm going to select these handle components and I'm actually going to rotate them this way, like so. Notice that right here in my timeline, all these rotations of the components were recorded. So if I press play, we can see that that's now part of my animation. Maybe I now want to come on up here, like so, and I want to actually animate this vise sliding inwards. So I'm gonna hit transform and I'm gonna select my handle and this part of the vise and I'm going to drag it in like this. But we have a couple things that just happened. First off, I forgot a piece, right? So we're going to see that part of my vice slides and this other piece stays. And that's because Fusion has no idea what this product is. It doesn't know how the components are supposed to interact, right? It doesn't know what it's supposed to do. So it's up to us to make it look right, look realistic as we go. And second, all of this is happening in one second, right? That's not necessarily how I want it to happen. I might want to create an animation that lasts, you know, 10 seconds and all this happens in 10 seconds. So while I recommend as you introduce this is let your students just play around, let them drag things, let them move things, let them kind of experience the movement because kind of like choreographing a video or a commercial, it takes some practice to figure out the best angles and things as you go and as you work. And then we can actually work with this and tweak it and modify it. So I'm actually going to real quick delete this stuff and I'm gonna show you kind of like a, a very quick, more start to finish here of our rendering of our um, of our product here. So I'm just going to click away. Here we go. I'm going to go to my starting position of where I want to be on my vice. And actually what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to go to my design and turn off this sketch that I left on. So that way I don't have this really big box around my design. So I have my vice. I want the first thing is to orbit around my vice Actually, before I even start, I want to lower this handle. I want my handle to be in the lock position. So I'm going to move this timeline over to zero. And before I even start my animation, I'm going to transform this handle. So it's technically in the locked position like this. Excellent. Now I'm going to go to where I want my camera to be when I start my animation, which is right here. And I'm going to drag my slider out to say two seconds. Across two seconds, I want to orbit my camera around. So I'm looking at the back of my vice like this, like so. Okay. Um, oh, I accidentally didn't turn 
view on. So sorry, let me do that one more time. I didn't have my view recording. I want to rotate around to the back of my vice like this. And notice that the camera just recorded. And if I push play, we can see that camera movement. Perfect. Then, after two more seconds or so, I want to zoom in on the handle like this. And then after two more seconds or so, I want to rotate this handle up. So what I'm doing is I'm moving my playhead as I rotate and move through my camera, my view, my transform, and everything. And you'll see that all these components just rotated. And if we play this back, we can see that we rotate around, we zoom in, and then we rotate our handle. So this is giving me that animation. So it's a combination of moving your playhead, tweaking and modifying your shapes. Let's go ahead a little bit more and let's click on these components like so. I'm just selecting more than one component at a time. And let's slide this in like that. Let's come over here and let's zoom out and rotate like this. And let's come over here. And now I want to put this handle back down, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is click on these components like so and bring this guy back down. And I think this is going to be my completed animation. So when I play this, we rotate around my vise. We zoom in and everything I do from movements to camera movements and everything is recorded. Now you might find after you do this that like, hey, wait a minute, that camera movement happened way too fast. So you can actually click on these shapes and you can slide them. You can change them on where they happen in the timeline. You can also make them longer. So for example, if I want to make this camera movement slower, I can drag this and I can click on these shapes and I can move them um, either one at a time or you can click on a couple at a time and tweak where they are in the timeline. And if you even have like a really complex animation, you can even create multiple storyboards. So you can have multiple storyboards here and kind of switch between your storyboards. So that way, if you have a really complex design, you can uh, allow it to kind of go through. And I see somebody ask a question, does the design need to actually fully function uh, in order this to work? And the answer is no. So for example, you can just make any two parts collide into other two parts right now. This isn't working based off of assemblies. So for example, if these two parts collide and they don't actually fit together, that would be an assembly, which you can do. And we talked about that in the last webinar, how to make parts actually like thread together. This is literally very basic components moving like components as if you were dragging shapes and things like that around. So there are no rules to your animation, which is super cool. Now I mentioned Fusion has no idea what this design is. Um, and actually before I move on, I just wanna show you after you're done this and you preview it, you can see there's a very easy publish button it's never been easier just to like set your screen resolution, download this, and you can save this as a video file, which is awesome. And then I see, can you combine multiple animations together, not in Fusion, but for example, if you have two few video files, they're generic. So you could edit those, you could put those into like a video editor and tweak those like that. Um, but if you did have multiple designs, you wanna bring multiple designs together and have multiple storyboards, that you can do very easily. Um, and I'm not actually gonna export this, but what I want to do is I want to show you that there is an auto explode version. And this is kind of cool. This one, the animation does kind of sort of happen for you. So I'm going to switch to a design that I pre-created. Uh, this is like a typical outlet junction box that we have here in the United States. And you can see that I have uh, screws that hold this plate on, right? I have this plate cover. I have the actual outlet like this. And then off the outlet, I have my different screws to actually thread my electrical conduit and wires and everything together, right? So this is an outlet. And what I wanna do is I wanna create an exploded animation kind of like this, where it separates and it comes apart. And this is super common, where you might be designing a catapult. You want the catapult to disassemble so you can see all the parts. You're designing you know, the en an engine or something and you wanna see all the inner workings. And Fusion's animated uh, animation window has a really handy feature to help you do this very quickly. So I'm gonna to switch to animation uh, for this one. And I just realized I already did it here, but I'm gonna do it here in front of you. So let me delete my animation real quick and we'll do it together. So I'm gonna to switch to animation. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to select all of my components that I want to animate, which in theory might not be all of them. So you might not want everything to move, but in this case I do. And I'm gonna hit this auto explode. And when I click on this, I get a new window that appears and I can adjust 
the slide level. Now, Fusion doesn't know what this is. So it doesn't know that it's an outlet box. So it has no idea that these screws can actually go backwards. So it's going to kind of guess on where your shapes could go. And it's going to give you a good starting point, And then you can kind of adjust them uh, and tweak it. You can turn on either one step or sequential. So for example, one part slides after the other, or you can do a one step explode. You can even turn on trail lines to show you where the parts came from, which is super cool. And I'm gonna hit okay. And we have this animation that happens super fast and kind of not perfectly correct, but that's okay. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of these animated features in my timeline, I'm gonna drag it out. So that way this doesn't happen in a second, this happens in like six seconds or so. So this is gonna make my animation go a little bit slower, which is nice. I'm then gonna use the transform tools just to kind of tweak these shapes and help them go where I want them to go. So I can click on this face plate, move this out a little bit. This screw and this screw should be all the way out in the front, not in the back, right? So Fusion guessed and it was a little off. So I'm gonna move those out here. I might move this screw out here and I'm not really sure how it got all the way over here, but I'm gonna move that here, right? So I'm gonna just tweak the positions because again, Fusion doesn't know what the shape is. So you as the designer need to make sure that the parts kind of go where they should go, but it gives you a really fantastic starting point uh, to save you a lot of time. And it's interesting, some designs that I've done, it's like really, really close as if it did know what it was. Of course, it's just an algorithm that's kind of sort of guessing and checking. Um, but sometimes Fusion gets surprisingly close. Like this was not bad other than the screws that were all over the place. This was pretty spot on. So now I have this exploded outlet. And if we um, watch our animations, I just realized I had all of these things kind of over here. So my movements happen after the fact because I didn't have my playhead in the right spot. But don't worry, I did this ahead of time and I'm gonna switch to my screen where I'm gonna show you a really well, very carefully done uh, one where he wasn't rushed in just a few seconds of what an explode animation can look like, something like this. And again, all of these features are, uh, or all these things are in the slideshow. So that way, when you wanna kind of recap, review, like, wait a minute, how did you do that? What buttons did you push? The slideshow is gonna be emailed out to you tomorrow and you can see that everything is annotated Everything that I demoed here live is actually taken in this slideshow. And we're going to share this out with you. Even, for example, uh, the vice animation, which is a little fast, but that's in here as well. So you can have access to all these things, even though we went super fast um, as we go ahead. Um, so I see a awesome question that um, Nicole is answering, um, which I'm, Nicole, keep doing what you're doing. But I'm just going to talk about this. It's such a good question is how do you see this in a high school setting, right? All the times I am challenging my students um, to design real products and things like this and think in the world of the designer, design a case or a, a device or a robot or something that's gonna help people, empathy, whatever it is. And when we Google and we look at inspiration and we see, for example, on a website of a product of this really cool thing that's moving, and I can't name them all here in the Zoom, but I promise if you go on any technology company's website, you'll see their products moving and experiencing it in commercials and all of that. This allows you to let your students take their designs either from Scratch and Fusion or from uh, Tinkercad and recreate them in this simulated animated world, just like professional industry standard people are doing, just like they would do with their real uh, products and all those things that they're putting on sale. So imagine, for example, a lot of folks I know do like a um, Shark Tank style project, which I love, especially if you're in the world of technology and STEM, where you kind of have to pitch a product and what would the company be like? and What would the logo be like? And how would it actually affect the world, right? Imagine your students are making an animated commercial where they can really visualize their products. And one thing I love about animation in particular is the fact that it doesn't need to be a perfect design. It doesn't need to be rods and threads and gears that mesh perfectly. Somebody asked, what if the design doesn't quite line up right? In the animated view, you have full control over making it transform however it is that you want it to transform, which means that your students don't need to have an exceptionally high level of CAD to find success. And it means that they can bring their ideas uh, through the design process, as somebody just said, um, to actually bring them to life in a really, really cool 3D space that looks just like the pros, because it's realistically the same type of tools that professional designers and engineers are using, which is super awesome. So before we just open up our Q&A, and I love the questions that are coming out here, so thank you so much. We have a couple things that I want to offer before we run out of time. 
as a recap, I think I just did my recap realistically in that little speech there. I think that was my recap of everything you can do uh, with animating and why it's important and why it brings it into, uh, uh, why I bring these types of things into your classroom. But I just want to remind you that in addition to the slideshow, the recording, all these things that we're talking about, um, there's a lot of great resources that are linked throughout this entire slideshow. Like for example, how to get started with Fusion 360 specifically from Tinkercad, different Autodesk uh, Fusion 360 tutorial videos and training and things, and even example projects and challenges. And all these great resources are not only all over the slideshow, but all over both the Autodesk site, the Tinkercad site, and more. And I also just want to point out that you can and your students can actually get an official certification. Like you can certify yourself with Fusion 360 and other Autodesk programs, which is super cool. Looks fantastic on a resume. And for you attending this webinar live, thank you so much. We are going to be following up with a one hour uh, professional development certificate along with the slideshow recording and everything else that we mentioned as well. And before we dive into the Q&A, I want to ask Randy, if you don't mind, to just, I mentioned all the cool challenges and like events and things briefly, but what are some of the other things that folks can see in the Autodesk world for Fusion? Right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I work on a website called Instructables. For those who've never heard of it, it's a project sharing website with lots of how-to step-by-step instructions. And we have a special page just for teachers where you could go and find basically projects curated that use Fusion 360, as well as contests that um, have Fusion 360 judges' prizes. Um, I believe. Right. Yep. Oh, this is not one of them, but we currently are running the Anything Goes contest. And if you wanted to try Instructables, and this is a really low stress way to do it, you can enter that. And you or your students can enter the Anything Goes contest. Literally anything can be entered, anything goes. Uh, so that's a fun one. And then we have a student contest exclusively for students using Fusion 360 to design arcade related projects. So it could be like an arcade machine, a ski ball machine, like a coin dispenser. Um, we're, it's pretty broad. I know it's arcade themed, but it's not. we're not encouraging students to design video games necessarily. It's more about designing machines and ways of engaging in kind of like an arcade setting. And imagine how cool rendering would be in that. Like you can render your designs to be shiny black plastic and all these different textures and things like that. There's a lot of great ways to apply tonight's webinar specifically in that contest. Even imagine like an arcade cabinet opening, like an animation or something would be super cool. Yes, Love that. And I also want to tease, we don't, oh, we have, we have another contest, but I will, but before we, let's go to the next contest and then we could talk about it. There's a the Stay Warm contest, which is not Fusion specific, but it um, is a fun contest. It's basically anything to stay warm. So if you like knitting, maybe you do. Or if you want to build a heater, or you could design um, basically a, a stove out of metal, and that's a great project for Fusion. Um, so there's lots of things you could do that would apply to that contest. And we also have a series of student contests that are going to be semester long launching in February running to mid-May and they're student only contests and um, sort of teasing them now but come to the next uh, webinar and you'll learn all about them. Yeah definitely definitely stay tuned lots of great challenges and in addition to obviously these challenges and I see some folks saying love Instructables us too so thank you for that. Um, if you just go to Instructables.com and if you I'm going to go back a couple slides here but you'll notice that there's literally like a big Fusion 360 button right under the teachers tab and that gives you, somebody asked earlier, like, is there a lesson plan for this? There are tons of awesome Fusion 360 lessons and projects and things like that, as well as Tinkercad and a bunch of other awesome things. So you can find all of that on Instructables. And as we mentioned, we will be back in two weeks, same place, same time, for a webinar called Get Started with CNC, where we'll be looking at how to take a 2D or a 3D design in the world of manufacturing using like a CNC mill, lathe, router, et cetera. Lots of really great topics and things like that that we're looking forward to chatting about. And as Randy and I have mentioned, there's also a ton of things coming soon. So definitely stay tuned and uh, stay uh, posted with all of the different things that we have. So before we dive into the Q&A, and I see that we have some questions and things like that, uh, which we are totally going to answer. I just want to give you a second to see all of our faces uh, bigger. So hello. And again, if you aren't going to stick around for the Q&A, uh, thank you so much for coming to this webinar live. We hope that you enjoyed it. We know that we went really fast and we covered so much. So stay in tune for the recording, the slideshows, all the follow-up resources. And again, thank you so much for what you do and supporting your students. And thanks for joining us here tonight if you are going to head out. So thank you very much.